Hello guys and welcome back to another video. Cast your mind back to 1997. I personally don't remember much from that year. I was only one year old after all. This old, tired desktop computer needs a bit of work. It looks like something has been living in it, but it doesn't look like it's missing too many parts. We've got a pretty basic graphics card, 64 megabytes of PC100 RAM, and a power supply of dubious quality. I got this old desktop off a guy called John. A link to his Twitter is in the description below. Does it still work? And can we play games on here? I think it's time we power it up and find out. Let's start with the good things. It posts and the PC speaker is making sounds. However, the CPU fan is incredibly loud. It is spinning. Perhaps it's just misaligned or clogged with dust. In the BIOS utility, I tried to detect the hard disk, which was clicking very loudly. After some time, it did detect a capacity of 1.6 gigabytes. It's quite likely that it no longer functions. After trying to boot to the hard drive, it didn't detect an operating system. Inside, it's missing the cables that connect both the CD-ROM and the floppy drive to the motherboard. Thankfully, I've got a filing cabinet full of these things. You never know when you're going to need parts for these old computers. I think it's time we try and install an operating system to that clicking hard disk, just to see if it's even possible. Another thing that needs attention is the fact that the CD-ROM drive doesn't want to eject properly. Not only that, the floppy drive doesn't work either. I was able to boot straight to my Windows 98 install CD, which is nice. That being said, the Windows 98 installer couldn't work with the faulty hard drive. Thankfully, I've got a surplus of ancient computer hard drives. This 2.1 gigabyte Seagate drive should be a good fit. Since I originally pulled this from a computer over 15 years ago, I don't recall what was on it. It looks as if the Seagate hard drive is blank. Now it's time to install a fresh copy of Windows 98. The whole installation will apparently take up only 264 megabytes of drive space. And about 30 minutes later, the system was nearly ready to use. Here I could put all of my details and provide the product key. There is thankfully no internet activation required. I'll never get sick of hearing that startup chime. As we can see, we've got 64 megabytes of RAM and the CPU is a Cyrix M2, which is apparently clocked at about 207 megahertz. The graphics card is an S3 Trio 64V, which has no 3D acceleration support at all. Gaming on here is going to be quite a challenge with this computer, so let's try our luck restoring it. Before we take things further, I'd like to tell you that today's video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. If you're after a sleek, compact wallet, then this may be for you. It can hold up to 12 cards and there's room for cash on the back. There are over 30 different styles and colors, and the Ridge Wallet features RFID blocking, protecting you from digital pickpockets. Get free worldwide shipping as well as returns and 10% off by going to ridge.com forward slash pcivrai and use the code pcivrai. This style of PC was very common in the low end market. All of the designs of these beige towers look pretty similar. There is very little airflow or room for cable management, but they are at least very easy to take apart. I'll be cleaning out the power supply as it does still work. All of these drives are held in place with several Phillips head screws. Taking a closer look at the failed WD Caviar drive, we can see that it has a warranty date of April 1997 from a shop called Intel Mark. I'll do my best to fix the floppy drive and eject mechanism of the CD-ROM. The front bezel was only held in place by a few plastic clips. I wasn't expecting it to pop off so easily though. In older desktops like this one, the power button is a switch that connects directly to the power supply circuitry. Cleaning up the remnants of whatever lived in here was quite challenging. It looks as if the case sat outside somewhere with access to bugs and mice. Since I plan on spray painting the frame, I sanded the problem areas down. This revealed that there wasn't rust, more so just tarnishing on the surface. I went around the rest of the case and sanded back any corrosion I could find. Next, I sprayed on some grey primer, which will help the final layer of paint stick to the metal. I applied several layers of aluminium silver spray paint throughout the day. With any luck, it'll look somewhat better. I'm by no means good at painting. I like to think I've improved since I did this last though. Since I had some time to kill between painting the frame, I decided I wanted to restore the yellowed plastic to something a little more beige. I made sure to clean off the plastic with some eucalyptus oil. Once out in the sun, I sprayed on a solution of hydrogen peroxide and whitening bleach. 
I frequently applied more coats as the day went on. After an hour, I placed cling wrap over the wet plastic and let it sit for a few more hours. I ended up placing the other plastics in a bath of the solution as well. The Hyena power supply was probably one of the cheapest ones you could buy 23 years ago. I'll dust out the fan and internals, but I'll be not taking it apart any further. I'll respray the cover, and to avoid damaging the label further, I'm going to cover it with some masking tape. I did a few coats, which definitely improved it somewhat. The masking tape did a very good job of keeping the label paint free, although it did rip the paper label at the bottom. With the internals dusted out, I reinstalled the cover. It's not perfect, but I'd say it does look a whole lot better. The cooler covering the Socket 7 CPU is quite clogged with dust. I'm also not sure how effective it is at cooling either. Underneath I discovered that it's running an IBM branded Cyrex 2 233. This black cap variant I have here is quite collectible and was released in May of 1997. Opening up the cooler we get a look at just how rusted and dirty it's become. After a quick cleaning and painting of the metal tensioning arm it nearly looked like new again. On the other side it uses a very small thermal pad. I think it's a pad. Anyway I'm going to remove it and use thermal paste instead. It doesn't really matter how much I use, literally anything will be better than what it had before. Cracking open the floppy drive, I don't see any obvious signs of damage. Even after putting in a disk, it seems to mount and eject correctly. I then decided to clean off the old gunky lubricant from the stepper motor. In its place, I applied some dry lubricant with Teflon. This should allow easy movement during normal operation. The CD-ROM drive was now ejecting fine all on its own. Well, most of the time anyway. Inside you can see the optical laser and spinning motor rise up when the tray is inserted. The eject mechanism problems are actually caused by the drive belt perishing after many years of use. Replacements can be found pretty cheap online. I personally didn't have enough time to purchase a replacement, so I simply rehydrated the rubber by putting it in some water. Now that the paint is dried, we can see just how different it looks. An improvement for sure. All round the frame is a far more uniform silver colour. I also ended up painting over the drive caddy, which had quite a bit of tarnishing on the metal. The reassembly was pretty easy. That's another thing I really love about these old desktops. They're very easy to pull apart and work on. I also put in a new CR2032 BIOS battery, which can be purchased for about a dollar online. While there isn't much room for cable management, I did try my best to make it look somewhat tidy. The plastics on the front are also quite a bit wider. The CD drive, which I haven't whitened, was the same colour as the surrounding plastics before. There we have the restored system. It's great to see it looking cleaner once again. We'll have to see whether the fan is any quieter now. I also ended up putting in a second stick of memory, bringing the total to 128 megabytes. With the time and date set correctly, we can now finally use this low-end PC from 1997. Actually, we've got one more hurdle. The floppy drive is still not working. I just decided to simply put in another drive that I restored earlier. After looking through some drawers, I found a few slot covers to put on the back, and now I can struggle to put the poorly designed case back on. I would have loved a setup like this when I was really young. There's a few areas where the whitening isn't great, but overall, this computer looks far better. It's now time to see what it's like using this old computer. I thought I'd create an appropriate background for this computer. With 128 megabytes of RAM, an insane amount for 1997, we shouldn't have any problems with memory. What's this? Apart from some graphical glitching, Worms 2 runs absolutely great on this system. The lack of 3D acceleration hardware really hurts in a lot of games. With the settings lowered, 3D games like Monster Truck Madness 2 are still playable, but the frame rate is quite choppy when there are multiple vehicles on screen. Now it's time to pop in our copy of Fresh for Gamers, including the music and a full version of Internet Explorer 4.0. Is your CD certified Fresh for Gamers, eh? I didn't think so. This is so 90s that I think my eyes are going to bleed. There's plenty of game previews, demos, and music that I'm pretty sure is copyrighted. Off of that demo disc, we've got Banjo-Kazooie. I mean Mario 64. No, no, I mean Croc, Legend of the Gobos. A 3D platformer that clearly takes inspiration from similar games at the time. It's totally playable on this system. Once again, the lack of a 3D accelerator card really hurts the 3D gaming experience. Touring Car Championship doesn't run well at all. 
A far simpler game, Microsoft Golf 2.0 ran absolutely great. If you want to take a swing at some golf, this game is for you. It's in the rough. Go! An older 3D game, Carmageddon, was a lot of fun on this computer. Other simple 3D games such as Hover also run great with the S3 Trio 64. This was a free game included on the Windows 95 install CD. Duke Nukem 3D is another childhood favourite of mine. The Sound Blaster 16 card creates an interesting rendition of the theme song. The game itself also runs very well. This wouldn't be an old PC video if I didn't show off some of the screensavers. The 3D maze was endlessly exciting to me when I was young. Maybe you should listen to what the sign is saying. Last of all, it's time I created a masterpiece in Microsoft Paint. Between Windows 95 and Windows XP, Paint stayed largely unchanged. It's been a lot of fun cleaning up this old machine. Hopefully, I can find some more like this in the near future. So anyway, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next video.